Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining me. The lost art of software design. Over the past decade, maybe actually two decades, a whole bunch of teams have thrown away things like big design up front. This is good. There's, there's a bunch of bad things associated with big design up front. However, these teams have also thrown away thinking architecturally, things like documentation, diagramming, modeling, all of that stuff has unfortunately all gone as well. It was one of these baby and bathwater moments. We threw all of that stuff away in one bucket. And there's a great quote I like to use to really summarize what I've seen over the past decade or two. And it's this by Dave Thomas. Big design up front is dumb. Doing no design up front is even dumber. And this really epitomizes the, the switch I've seen over the past couple of decades from big design up front to, in many cases, no design up front. And that's kind of what this session is all about. You'll hear, the, uh, you'll hear people these days talking about, well, you should be doing upfront design, you should be doing evolutionary design. Uh, and this is where you kind of have a bunch of things you need to deliver in your first sprint, and then you do some design to support those features, and then you deliver those features, and then you do some more design to, to, to support more features, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a great book about this topic called Building Evolutionary Architectures, but it's not easy. If you get the ordering of some of these decisions wrong or suboptimal, you end up kind of sprinting too fast and accumulating lots of technical debt. So there's a certain skill involved in uh, getting evolutionary architecture right. One of the things you'll hear people talk about, of course, is that you should build your architectures so they can be changed in the future. And I totally agree. You know, build changeability, adaptability into your architectures. But the way we do this often results in some significant decisions being made. And sometimes these are conscious decisions, and sometimes they're unconscious. And these are some of the themes that we're going to be exploring during this session. I'm going to be using the word design a lot. And when I talk about design, I'm really referring to the technical aspects of design, which for me is really around choosing technologies, modularity, decomposition. It's that type of thing rather than product design, UX, UI, A-B testing, et cetera. Right, all of that stuff is super useful, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. So I'm going to outline my goals for this talk right up front. And my goal is this. I want to explain why some degree of upfront design is useful, even in 2022, and I want to provide some tips on how we can do this better as a team. And really, this is my recommended approach that I work with uh, for most organizations, most customers. It's some degree of upfront design, but admitting we're not going to get everything right the first time, and we are going to need to pivot and change direction, which, of course, is the essence of being agile and agility. So this is me. I'm the author of a bunch of books, independent consultant, spent most of my career building software, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things I used to do a lot before the pandemic thing, was fly around the world and run architecture workshops. These workshops basically took the form of this, like here's two pages of requirements, break yourself up into groups of two or three or four people, and create a software solution to meet that set of requirements. And the exercise was really just phrased like this, go design a software solution and draw one or more architecture diagrams to describe your solution. And this is a really fun little workshop. It's uh, an architecture carter. And there were two iterations. Iteration one, I provide very little guidance on how people should be doing this exercise, specifically with regards to things like diagrams. And the diagrams look like this. If any of you have seen me talk before, I've shown these diagrams in probably every single talk. These diagrams are horrendous. Now, these are some of the more extreme examples of the diagrams I normally see during the first iteration of my workshop. Uh, here are some better examples. So what, so what we do is we, we get people to look at the diagrams and we say, right, do a quick review of the diagrams that have been produced. List of, thing, uh, list of things you like, list of things you think can improve the diagrams, and a score between 1 and 10. So some of the diagrams I get during my workshops tend to look a little bit like this. There's some information here. This scored a 7 out of 10. Here's another one from the same workshop. 
check this out. I like this little user, uh, that one there. It's like a, a shocked user and a happy user at the bottom. Um, this different colors, different boxes, shapes, not really sure what's going on here. This also is called seven. Here's another example showing like a, a back end and a front end, Angular front end, .NET back end. This doesn't tell you much at all. It also scored a seven. There's a theme here. Uh, here's another one. I love this box in the middle at XCOM. I don't know what that means. I think it's external communication. But why is it so big? No idea. That's scored a seven. This one here, kind of high level architecture diagram, I guess, seven. This one here, same sort of thing. When people draw boxes stacked up, that's like we need lots of these things, <laughs> I guess. Uh, that also scored a seven. And this one scored a six. And these are pretty representative of the diagrams I, I, I've seen on my uh, recent workshops, for example. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, what's wrong with these diagrams? Because they all scored like 7 out of 10 on average. And I'm going to come back to this later. But the diagram's not good. So we do a bunch of stuff. And I introduced my C4 model for visualizing software architecture. And we do iteration number two. And during iteration number two, guess what happens? We get much, much better diagrams, and they look like this. So this is the example I showed in my talk yesterday. Uh, this group was designing this system here. They identified a couple of users and a bunch of system integration points, which is quite nice. We do the pinch to zoom in movement. Now we kind of see inside that red box, and now we're looking at applications and data source. These are called uh, containers in the C4 model. So we're getting much, much nicer diagrams during the second iteration. And of course, this is the comment that comes back. So you're running a diagramming workshop, and you're teaching people how to draw nice diagrams. Is that right? I'm like, well, a little bit. But there's a little bit more to unpack behind the scenes here, and that's what I want to talk about. So the first kind of major topic I want to talk about here is, is the, just the concept of doing upfront design. I get teams asking me, even today during my workshops, are we allowed to do upfront design? Which is a really weird question to ask me. I'm like, well, why don't you think you're allowed to do upfront design? And then they reply back with something like, well, we don't do upfront design because we do extreme programming. I'm like, well, where does it say in the XP book that you can't do thinking and upfront design? And again, there's a kind of mismatch and a misconception here. I get a bunch of people saying, well, we're agile, so we don't do upfront design. I'm like, well, where did that come from? People say it's not expected in agile. Again, there's, you know, where did this come from? And the answer is, you go dig through the old literature around agile approaches. So this is from the Wikipedia page for extreme programming. There is no big design up front. Most of the design activities takes place on the fly and incrementally. Simplest thing, possibly working, et cetera, et cetera. So this is always kind of steering you down a route. Uh, this uh, little um, piece of text here for one of Martin Fowler's essays, there's a whole bunch of words. Um, in the middle, I've highlighted some. Certainly, the most aggressive XBers are putting more and more energy into avoiding any upfront architectural design. So again, it's kind of steering you down that route of uh, trying not to do much upfront work. I liked this little tweet um, from Stacy. Uh, I think the phrase, whilst we value those on the right, we value those on the left more, is forgotten quite often. So if you look at the Agile Manifesto front page, it's got the, um, we value something over something else. Uh, like working software over comprehensive documentation. It's unfortunate that many people have misinterpreted this to say, well, we don't really care about documentation, and that's not the case here. And the Agile Manifesto doesn't say this, but it's also not suggesting and encouraging people to do things like documentation and design. And this is one of the things you have to kind of watch out for. The people who are promoting Agile approaches are also not explicitly saying, by the way, you should think about do doing some design when necessary. So there's often stuff that's not being mentioned that's quite important, and it's easy, it's easy to misunderstand that. If you go back 20 years when Manifesto was created, those folks had a ton of experience, like probably way more experience than most of us have here. And that means their mindset was very different. They had a very different way to think about problems and come up with solutions. And this is something else we need to kind of factor into this. Now, a couple of years ago, I kind of had a quick thought experiment run through my mind. What would happen if you took one of these really experienced agile people and dropped them into a domain that they're not as familiar with as software development? And this happened. 
So Kent Beck posted a photo of an outline for a book he was thinking about writing. Now, the photo is upside down. I don't know why. <laughs> it just is. But basically, he says, uh, I've got some time free. Uh, I've got an, an, an idea for a book. Here's the outline. And of course, you know what's coming next. Somebody kind of popped up and said, well, it's kind of interesting and intriguing that you write an outline first. Uh, my daughter has discovered that when writing with Flow, it's easier to kind of refactor as you go along, much like software, of course. And Kent, to his credit, replied. And he said, I've done circa 20,000 words on software design. To write a book, I need to see a whole, in part to reduce my anxiety. That's exactly how I feel about building software. If I've got a, a new thing to go and design, I don't want to rush into the detail. I want to kind of step back and say, right, what is the thing that we're looking at here, and how does it fit into the world around it? So this is why I want to get people to save some time and, and really focus on that bigger picture. Now, of course, in order to do design, we need a bunch of tools in our toolbox. Agility requires a whole toolbox of different techniques and practices. And I think it's unfortunate that, that many organizations and universities, to be fair, have stopped teaching a bunch of this stuff. So why am I, why am I saying this? Here's a little thought experiment you can do with your own teams when you, when you get back to your offices. Go ask them how they design software. Like, you have some requirements. Someone has asked you to go do some design. What do you do next? And they'll go, uh, we use a whiteboard. Right? What are you using a whiteboard for? Well, we're drawing pictures. OK, what are these pictures? Well, we're drawing boxes and lines. Oh, dear. <laughs> this is me disappearing into my rabbit hole. What do you mean by boxes and lines, et cetera, et cetera? And then you say, eventually, well, what do the boxes represent? And they're like, oh, the boxes represent components. There's another conversation we had there. And when you keep poking people and poking people, they end up saying, well, OK, we just use our experience. And that's the answer you get back from many teams when you ask them, how do you design software? They're like, oh, we just use our experience. And this is great, I guess, because we should use our experience. But it's not a good way to explain how we do design especially if we are being tasked with coaching and mentoring other staff, more junior staff. And it turns out there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that people just don't know about these days. So the concept of decomposition, you go to Wikipedia and it tells you all the different uh, ways to decompose uh, a solution into um, different modules and you know, layers and et cetera, et cetera. You'll see this paper crop up a lot when uh, you see people talking about things like microservices. This is a paper from the 70s. And it talks about modular programming. But what people do is they kind of cross out the word modular and add service in there. And all of this stuff is completely applicable today. There's a cool technique called CRC, Classes, Responsibilities, Collaborators. It's a kind of older uh, workshopy technique. We don't sit around a table and do class level design anymore, of course. But you can take this approach and do higher level collaborative design around services or components, for example. One of the big problems here, of course, is that many teams seem to think that the concept of upfront design is about creating a perfect end state. Like it's a set of blueprints that we aim towards, like we did 20 years ago, and we must never deviate from that end state. And I don't think we're trying to do that. I think we're trying to do something different instead. This is a great cartoon I like to use to kind of illustrate this point. It's, uh, it's called Evolutionary Design, beginning with, with, a, beginning with Prince of Hole by Josh Kirievsky. Imagine you want to build a really nice sounding guitar, but you want to do it in iterations. You do version one, couple of strings, sounds crappy. Get some feedback, add some more things, some more features, make it sound better. And we've seen this over the past decade, this whole iterations, minimum viable products thing has been done to death. We should all know this by now. So why am I including it in this talk? Because what nobody talks about is version one. Like, how do you get a good enough version one that gives you a sufficient set of foundations to add those features to? If I go back, you can see the transitions between the uh, end results after every iteration. So when you're at the end of your project's life cycle, you can see the transitions. At the start of your project life cycle, you're like, well, we're here at the start. We don't know which way this is going to go. 
And that's what makes this interesting and, and complicated, of course. The Azure Manifesto, when you click through to page two, you get the principles page. Principle number nine literally talks about good design. So continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. The easy way to think about this, from my perspective, is just to say a good architecture enables agility. This is arguably very subjective. You know, what does good mean? For me, a good architecture is really one that is it's highly modular and it's easy to change, it's easy to adapt. And this kind of makes sense, doesn't it? From a gut feel perspective, this makes sense. If you've ever worked on those horrible big balls of mud projects, who's working on them? Don't answer that question. If you, if you work on those horrible big ball of mud projects, they're very brittle, they're very fragile. Every time you make a change here, a bunch of code here breaks and you don't know why, but it slows you down. If you have a highly modular architecture, you can make a change inside these things that we might call modules, and you don't get that horrible blast or ripple effect of that change outwards to other parts of your code base, for example. So a good architecture lets you move fast, essentially. But you don't get that for free. You have to put some thinking into this to craft up a design that's going to allow you to move fast. And that's what I want to do here. I want to do enough upfront design to put a good starting point in place and set an initial direction that the team is going to follow. As I said, admitting that we might need to change direction. So for me, it's about, adding, it's, it's about creating a start point that adds a lot of value. That's, that's why we're doing this. And this applies to all teams. And really, I would throw this under the banner of technical leadership. So all teams need technical leadership, whether you're a one-person team or a hundred-person team or a thousand-person team. And technical leadership exists across organizations at different levels, upwards, downwards, sidewards, team-based, product-based, service-based. There's lots of ways to think about technical leadership. So that's something else to consider here. I am going to talk about diagrams because I always do. Uh, anyone who knows me. What happened to UML and all these diagrams I showed you before? Like, it's just gone. And when I ask people how many, like, how many people are here using UML, it's a tiny number. One out of 10, typically, something like that. So why aren't people using UML? Again, I've heard all the excuses. I don't know it. I'm the only person on the team who knows it. I had a client say this to my face. <laughs> Like, if you use UML here, you'll be seen as old. And then the guy sat next to him, followed it up with that. Wow. Uh, people think UML is too detailed. Uh, I mean, UML is the specs 800 pages or whatever. You don't have to use all of UML, but there's something about it that kind of sucks you into elaborating lots of detail, and then you get all the conversations about black, uh, black diamonds versus white diamonds, and no one knows the difference anyway. I've had people tell me this, we don't want to use UML because we don't want to tell developers what to do. I'm like, what? Like, a bunch of diagrams and telling developers what to do are, are two very different things here. Yes. <laughs> It's historically been hor horrible and very expensive. And this guy on YouTube uh, said it's a very elaborate waste of time. OK? So this kind of begs the question, well, what, what's his recommendation? And, and what do I hear most people kind of say as a, as a better option? And the answer is, just use a whiteboard. Yay. <laughs> I know how this advice goes, because I run workshops around the world, and I get people drawing whiteboard diagrams and they're all horrendous. So this whole just use a whiteboard thing, I'm a huge fan of whiteboards for doing design, don't get me wrong, but just use a whiteboard is not a sufficient amount of advice or guidance for most teams. And we get diagrams like that. Now, it's, it's of course at this point that people say, well, hang on a second, what's wrong with this stuff? Like, you've been berating these diagrams, what's actually wrong with these diagrams? Well, first of all, nobody knows they're bad. <laughs> because they all score seven out of 10, and that seems to be the average score we, uh, we see during these workshops. So what I do with my groups is to say, right, you've drawn a bunch of diagrams, swap diagrams with another group, and try and answer these two questions. And the answer that comes back after five minutes is, we can't. So why can't th th those two questions, which are quite basic questions, be answered by looking at the diagrams? because you can't see the solutions. 
Because the diagrams are such a mess, you can't see the solutions. If you can't see the solutions, you can't understand the solutions. If you can't understand the solutions, you can't review and evaluate them. And that's a huge issue. The whole Agile thing rears its ugly head here. You know, UML is not expected in Agile. Oh, come on, really? We're doing this again? Where's this come from? It's the same place. It's people saying, yeah, don't worry about case tools. Just scribble some stuff out on a bar napkin. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, again, from Ron Jeffries, you may well need some nicely formatted UML for your project, blah, blah, blah. But inside your co-located whole team, you most probably will not need them because the information you need will be communicated through the more effective medium of conversation. And this comes back to a line I hear lots of teams tell me, the value is in the conversation. And I get this, I agree. Like having useful conversations is hugely valuable. But I see this being used as an excuse to not create documentation. We get a bunch of developers around a whiteboard. We have a conversation. We draw some sketches. Are we all good? Are we all aligned? Yes, great. Now we erase the diagrams and no one takes a photo because the values in the conversation, that's the emphasis here. I had someone say this to me a while back. All the diagrams you've shown are actually excellent as long as there's a conversation about their meaning and intent. It's the accompanying conversation that matters. And again, I totally get that. I totally agree with that statement. However, as I've already said, you can't understand the solutions. You can't see the solutions. So the value is in the conversation will only work if you're able to have good conversations, the correct conversations. And there's no ambiguity in, in people viewing the diagrams through their eyes and their experience. So that's what we've got to watch out for with this whole diagramming stuff. Topic number three, I'm going to switch again. Superficial views of upfront design. When I run my architecture workshops, typically during iteration one, we get a bunch of diagrams with boxes and arrows. And all the boxes have like one word in them, and that's it. And sometimes when I'm kind of walking around the group, so listening to what they're saying and how they're doing the design exercise, I'll literally hear people saying this. So this diagram we've got, does it represent a microservices architecture? And someone's like, of course it does. Isn't it obvious? And then someone on the other side of the table will say, oh, I thought this was a monolith with components running in a monolith. And they've not had that basic discussion about the overall deployment strategy for this solution. Right, that's a, a huge amount of uh, vagueness and ambiguity to have in your design process. This is a bit specific. Why is the RM directly connected to the Angular front end? I'm going to take you back to one of the diagrams we showed you before. We have an Angular front end. There's a report viewer thing. There's a .NET back end, which in this case is NT Framework, is an ORM. And look, there's a line. There's an arrow going from the ORM up to Angular. I'm like, cool. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's not going to work, is it? Is the web UI getting data from S3? Again, this is something you see a lot. People are like, OK, we're going to stick data in S3. Perfect. And we're going to have a web app. So you have a web app box. And there's a line from the web app box to S3. And you're like, so what's the web app? Like, it's, a, it's an Angular app running in a browser. OK, perfect. How are you contacting? How are you connecting to S3? Oh, we can use the AWS JavaScript library to you know, just open a connection and pull stuff out of our private S3 bucket. Where are you storing your credentials in the HTML source code? Oh, that's a bad idea, isn't it? And again, they're not thinking through some of the implications of their design decisions. Why? Because they're not making proper design decisions. They're just jumping on the first solution that comes into the head, drawing that, and not really evaluating whether it's going to work. And I see this time and time again. I see teams kind of jumping on a solution. And you get diagrams like this. They're like high-level logical architecture diagrams. There's just a bunch of boxes with names in. And then people say, oh, yeah, we need security, so then we're going to have a security box. Awesome. <laughs> How? We'll do that later. We're agile. OK. George Fairbanks in his book says, you know, you don't get stuff for free. You can't just jump on any solution you think or any solution because of um, hype and trend and fashion. And you can't do resume-driven design. You need to think carefully about the designs and the architectures that you're choosing and adopting. And for me, one of the reasons I want teams to spend some time doing some thinking before they get into lots and lots of coding is because I think there's a bunch of unknown unknowns that they really need to uncover. 
And I like to use the S-curve of learning to kind of explain this. So imagine you're learning a new skill. At the start of your learning process for this new skill, it's very slow. You have to pick up the terminology and the jargon and some of the very kind of basic practices, for example. Once you get those things under your belt, your learning becomes much more accelerated. You get to pick up new things much, much quicker. After a period of time, and maybe this is the 10,000 hours thing, you start not learning so quickly and you start plateauing off. You can use this curve to explain upfront design as well. Big design upfront takes you all the way along that plateau for six months, a year, two years, three years, etc. And you don't get much benefit, and of course the world has moved on. The way I see many agile teams doing design is they get stuck here, they do like five minutes of design, oh, we're agile, we draw a box and we'll look into that box later, and they never get into the accelerated learning phase. That's where I want to get people. I want to get people here quickly. Tech decisions is something else we need to kind of weave into this whole conversation. One of the things I'm a big fan of is teams explicitly choosing technologies, because technologies are an architectural decision. They're things that are hard to change later. But when I see the diagrams from my workshops, those diagrams rarely have tech choices on during iteration one. Why? Because teams tell me this, we don't solutionize. I'm like, what? That's not even a word. And then they say, now what we mean is, our architects are not allowed to do solutioneering. I'm like, come on, stop making these words up. Like, the purpose of an architect or a designer is to create a solution. So how are your architects not allowed to create solutions? That's just bonkers. I've had people say this to me, we don't want to impose a solution upon the development team. You do. And I'm not saying this is the ivory tower dictatorship approach of architecture, but the whole point of doing design and coming up with an architecture is to put some guidance in place, some guardrails, some constraints. And those constraints often are important in the wider context of your environment. Cost, time, tech, vendor relationships, licenses, economies of scale, support, platform teams, etc. We want developers to choose the implementation details. Maybe at some level, but some of the high level details, maybe not. Again, maybe we need to factor in the constraints of the environment here. Or people say this, we've drawn a bunch of diagrams, and it's obviously a Java solution because we're a Java team. Well, I didn't know that. And new joiners might not know that either. And what I've noticed over the years is that the people drawing diagrams and doing upfront design will tend to have a, a hesitancy to put tech choices on the diagrams. But when people are reading and reviewing and evaluating the diagrams, they're like, if these diagrams had tech choices on them, I might be able to understand them easier as a developer. So there's an interesting conflict here. So this is the question I want to answer. How much upfront design should we be doing? And this applies to greenfield brand new solutions. And it also applies, to some extent anyway, to big changes to an existing code base. So imagine you are at the whiteboard with your colleagues, and you're sketching out some ideas for something you want to build or something you want to change. I would like you to be able to answer these two basic questions from what you've drawn on the whiteboard. Question number one, do the diagrams reflect what we think we're going to build? Question number two, is it going to work? That's it. These are the two questions I need answered to give me confidence that we're going down the right path. Now, we're not trying to choose everything. This is what separates big design up front from doing some design up front. We're not trying to choose our database schemas and all the column lengths and all of that stuff. You know, there's some bigger decisions that we're trying to make here, not all of the kind of lower level details. I love this quote from Grady Booch. He says that architecture represents the significant decisions where significance is measured by cost of change. I just love this as a way to think about kind of what are the decisions we want to be focusing on when we're doing architecture. And for me, it's stuff like, what languages are we using? You know, if you build a Java app, you're stuck with Java. If you've designed a set of microservices, you're stuck with a set of microservices. If you've designed a monolith, you're stuck with a monolith. 
If you've embedded a particular framework or library into your code base, you're stuck with that library or framework in your code base. These are the things that once you start using them, they become locked into your code base and hard to change. Stuff like do we use white spaces or, or you know, tabs? I don't care. I literally don't care. Just chuck it through some tooling. Martin Fowler said a lot of this stuff a long time ago. He says, I think there is a role for broad starting point architecture, such things as stating early on how to layer the application. So this is modularity, it's decomposition at a high level. It's your overall structural construct. How you'll interact with the database if you need one. So anything involving data storage tends to be significant. You know, once you have a database full of stuff, migrating databases is a real pain. And what approach, you, what approach to use to handle the web server. So these are, the, again, the major decisions that we're trying to focus on here. And it turns out this just use a whiteboard, the values in the conversation thing doesn't quite go far enough, from my perspective anyway. And this isn't a tooling issue. One of the questions people use to ask me is, Simon, you're forcing people to use paper and whiteboards. What about if you let them use a tool to do design? Well, guess what? You get the same in a tool. <laughs> you get the same exact horrible diagrams, just they look nicer. But they have all the same issues, boxes, unlabeled arrows, different shapes, different sizes, different colors, layers going one way, the other way. No one knows what this stuff means. So unless we get better at drawing diagrams, we can't answer that first question. Because we can't see the solutions, we can't understand the solutions, we can't review the solutions, we can't evaluate the solutions. So that's why I'm a really big fan of diagramming as a way to figure out how do we share an idea between the people in our team and the people that sit outside of our team, of course. And we need ubiquitous language. Not a, a domain-driven design ubiquitous language, but a, ubiqu a, big, uh, a ubiquitous language to describe the things that we want to talk about when we're describing our systems. And this is really where my C4 model for visualizing software architecture comes from. It's really based upon this principle, that having a common set of abstractions is much more important than a common notation. UML gives you both these things, but when I see people trying to use UML, they're normally abusing UML. Like you'll scan your eyes over a class diagram and you'll see like a message bus or a database or a person, and you're like, well, that's not a class, is it? So I, I, I kind of fall back to this concept instead. And this sounds like a step backwards, but there's a really good example of this in the real world, and it's a map. Get two maps of Krakow, put them side by side. The two maps show you the same things, don't they? Castle, river, the big square thing, all the shopping areas, the tram lines. The two maps show you the same thing, but they look different. Different color codings, icons, shadings, etc. How do you decipher a map? Well, there's a key in the corner, a legend. And it says, when you see this thing, it means X. So this is really powerful. A map is a nice example of a self-describing diagram. It's a well-known set of abstractions with a varying or variable notation. So if you want more information about my C4 model, you go to c4model.com, but it basically stands for Context, Containers, Components, and Code. And C4 is basically two things. It's a set of abstractions, so four hierarchical abstractions and four hierarchical diagrams that map onto those abstractions. And the concept here is literally diagrams as maps. So I live in Jersey in the Channel Islands. If you do a search for Jersey on Google Maps, it typically gives you that picture. If you want to know where the airport is, it's great. If you've never heard of Jersey, totally useless. It's too much detail too quickly. How do you fix this problem? Zoom out, pinch the zoom out, get some context. On the flip side, you can zoom all the way in. Go far enough, you get to Street View. Street View is a nice one-to-one -one mapping with reality, when the photos were taken, of course. And this notation independent, so you can have boxes and lines or UML. Like, there's nothing precluding you using UML for creating C4 model diagrams. And the reason I like diagrams so much is because I think diagrams are a really fantastic visual checklist for design decisions. And this is really powerful. So the system context diagram from the C4 model, in order to draw that diagram, you have to ask and answer these questions. What's the thing we're describing? What's the scope of the thing we're describing? So what sits inside the thing we're describing, our system, and what sits outside of our system boundaries? 
Who is using our system? Who are the roles, the actors, the personas who are using our system? What sort of things are they doing at a high level? And what system integration points do we need to support and put in place? Ask and answer those questions, and you can draw something like a system context diagram. And this is the one I showed you before. So this group was saying, this is the thing we are designing, the financial risk system. The text in the box describes the scope of that thing. They identified two different user types from the requirements and a bunch of external system dependencies, some that were given to them and some that they've chosen as a part of their solution. And it's nice, and, and if you go to c4model.com, there's a whole bunch of uh, tips and tricks around notation to make diagrams look nice, but fundamentally, this is a really powerful diagram. It's a fantastic analysis tool, and it's a fantastic diagram for basically showcasing this is what we're doing. And it's great for all audiences, both technical and non-technical. We take that red box and we pinch the zoom in, we drop down to level two of the C4 model, which is a container diagram. Who knows Docker? Right, not Docker. <laughs> There's an unfortunate clash of naming here. Um, I got the name first, but who cares? <laughs> So to draw a container diagram, a container is basically an application or a data store. These are the set of questions you need to ask and answer. So what are the major technology building blocks? What are the applications and the data stores that make up our system? How are we partitioning responsibilities across those applications and data stores? What technologies are we using and how are they communicating with one another at runtime? Answer those questions. And in order to answer those questions, you'll need to do some design, you'll need to do some thinking. You can draft up a container diagram. And this is the same diagram I showed you before as well. And it's a zoom in of that red box. And here we can see we have a couple of React apps in the corners. We have a, a Java Spring um, thing running on a, on a web server, a couple of uh, Java command line apps, and some data stores. And we've got uh, technologies on here and integration protocols, and there's some nice stuff going on here. So this is a great diagram to showcase this is the, this is the design of the thing um, that we're talking about. And the diagrams we draw should, uh, should spark meaningful questions. The diagrams I see from iteration one do not spark meaningful questions. The diagrams from iteration one, the seven out of 10 diagrams, typically spark questions like that. Like, why are you using so many colors? What do the arrows mean? What's the acronym mean? Why have you got different shapes? These are not useful questions to be asking. It's just visual noise. Like, all of this stuff should be really simple to figure out. The questions I want teams to be asking when they're looking at a set of diagrams are things like that. So I can see you've got two Java apps, and there's an arrow between them, signifying some degree of integration. How are you doing that? You've left off the protocol. Is it like a, a JSON over HTTPS protocol? Is it something through a message bus? Or are we doing like an RMI uh, remote invocation call? Like, let's talk about the integration, because it's not on the diagram. Or you scan your eyes over a diagram, and there'll be a, a little database symbol labeled Mongo. And you'll be like, we don't use Mongo here. Why have you chosen Mongo when our standard is Oracle? And again, you can have a much more meaningful conversation. You can start challenging the design because you can see the design. And that's exactly what this is all about. These diagrams generally lead to much richer design discussions as well. So during my workshop, although I am teaching people to draw nice diagrams, in order to draw nice diagrams, they have to do more thinking. If you have a couple of Java apps with an arrow between them, you have to figure out how are we making this work? What data is actually being transferred from Java app A to B? Is it synchronous? Is it asynchronous? We're having to make much, much better design decisions. This is fabulous because now we have a way to start, uh, we have a way to start scaling teams. And this is super important, of course, with the whole pandemic thing. Many teams have been remote working, working from home, and they're not able to have those impromptu conversations that they might have had in front of a whiteboard before the pandemic started. And the diagram should spark meaningful feedback. So the question I always get uh, during my workshop is, a group will be trying to design a solution using like a microservices or a serverless type architecture. And they'll come to me with this question. We're trying to diagram our serverless solution, but our diagram is getting complicated. 
how do you recommend we fix this problem? And my answer is, simplify your solution. Right, you've chosen a complicated distributed architecture, so your diagram is showing you a complicated distributed architecture. This is a good piece of feedback. This is perhaps this is too much for this little case study, and we need to simplify the solution. So the diagrams, again, the reason I put so much emphasis on the diagrams is because they really do help us answer that first question. But there are two questions on here. And you can have the, the most wonderful, perfect looking diagrams in the world, but potentially it's not going to help you answer that second question. Scott Ambler has a whole bunch of really cool stuff online about agile architecture and agility, and he's the creator of the disciplined agile delivery framework. And one of his essays you can summarize in one sentence. You should base your architecture on the requirements. So figure out what drives the architectural decisions. These are requirements, quality attributes, so performance and scaling, for example, the constraints of the environment you're working in, and maybe the set of principles that you adopt as a team around modularity, separation concerns, et cetera, et cetera. He says you should travel light. So he's saying, yeah, just you know, be agile. Do the simplest thing that could possibly work. Be lean, be lightweight. And more crucially, prove your architecture with concrete experiments. And this is the thing I want to weave into some notion of an upfront design process. One of the things I see agile, in air quotes, teams struggle with these days is risk. They're like, Simon, how do we deal with risks on our agile project? And my answer is, unpopular as it may be, go and read the RUP book. <laughs> so RUP, Rational Unified Process from 20 years ago, massive heavyweight process framework. Ultimately customizable, if you spent enough time customizing it. But RUP, the reason I like RUP even to this day is because it's a risk-driven approach to building software. It drags the risks to the early stages of the project lifecycle. It gets the tricky stuff out of the way, lets you iterate and add stuff more, much more easily. And this basically comes from the RUP book. You need to identify and mitigate your highest priority risks. Now, there are not many words here, but there's, again, there's a little bit to unpack here. And the problem with risks, of course, is that they're subjective, like estimates. And I know how we really dislike doing estimates. But thankfully, we have techniques that can remove the subjectivity associated with the estimation process. Planning poker. Planning poker is a fabulous technique because it removes things like anchoring biases. If we have a bunch of people and we go around the room, how long will it take to build this thing? And I say two weeks. I've anchored the whole conversation to two weeks, plus or minus a little bit. Whereas planning poker is a, is a nice way to remove that biasing. So I've come up with a technique you can find online. It's called risk storming. And it's a, a visual and collaborative technique for identifying risk. There's three basic steps. Step number one, draw a bunch of pictures. We know how to do that. Step number two, get a bunch of people looking at the pictures. Developers, designers, architects, marketing, product owners, scrum masters, operation staff security staff, compliance teams, literally anybody who might have some opinion on the thing we are designing, and give them a bunch of sticky notes to say, right, what do you perceive as being risky with this solution? And the risks we're looking for are anything, like technical risks, stuff breaking, data breaches, data, data leaks, uh, networks going down, uh, lack of skills and resources and, and time. There's a whole bunch of things we can try and identify here. And people are writing these things on uh, sticky notes, and different kind of sticky notes represent different priorities or levels of risks, and we're keeping them to ourselves, like planning poker. And that's a nice sort of sh uh, short kind of time box exercise, and then you get everybody to dump the sticky notes on the diagram. So if you identify a risk with a particular service, you stick your sticky note on that service. And now you do the planning poker thing. So like one person identified a risk and everybody else missed it, why? Are they super pessimistic? Or did everybody else really miss it? Or maybe multiple people identified the same risk with differing priorities. One thought it was a high priority risk, one thought it was a low priority risk. Why do we differ? Now we have the conversation like you would in planning poker. So it's a really nice kind of short technique to identify and um, kind of visualize your risks and your risk profile. 
And this can be done, again, greenfield project when you're building something from scratch, or when you have an existing code base and you're making a major change to it. So this is a technique you can use uh, during sprint planning, for example. And this is removing the bias. It's trying to get a view of the world through many people's eyes, not falling back on a single person's experience. Threat modeling is another approach to do this, of course. I, I see more and more dev teams these days doing things like threat modeling because they're putting stuff on the cloud and we've got the whole dev sec ops. So we're trying to kind of weave security into all of this. And things like uh, Stride is a good way to do things like threat modeling. One of the questions I get about the diagrams is how do we represent the decisions we're making on the diagrams? And the answer is you don't. You record those decisions as supplementary pieces of documentation in things like architecture decision records. So if you've not heard of this technique, I highly recommend um, uh, looking this up. It's just a very short set of structured text files that you use to record decisions, and more crucially, statuses of decisions. So if you have a bunch of these um, in, in a folder, you can check that folder in next to your source code control, and you can keep these things up to date. So when you make a decision, you write a record. When you change your mind, you supersede the, uh, the old record, you create a new one, you mark it superseded, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a really great way to capture the log of decisions that you're making. Small issue, I've avoided this question. <laughs> and I do want to answer this question, but I'm not going to, because it's not a good question to ask. When you ask this question, it elicits answers like that. I'm good with maybe a day for a one-year effort, so one day of design for a one-year of development effort. And that might work for whoever said this and their system and their team and their context, but trying to get like a, a number of days per development effort is just a really poor way to approach this whole question. Hence, I'm not going to answer the question of how much upfront design should we do. I'm going to answer a different question instead. Let's assume that we're doing some degree of upfront design. And let's also assume that that upfront design is iterative in nature. We're not going to get everything right first time round, so we might have to have a number of iterations. How do we know when to stop? This is a far more interesting question to look at. So we're doing some upfront design. How do we know when we've done enough? And for me, it's basically about looking at six goals. Number one. You understand the things that drive your architecture decisions. So you have a good understanding of the high-level requirements, not all of them. You have a good understanding of the important quality attributes, performance, scaling, security, the things that really affect whether your uh, product succeeds or fails. You understand the constraints in which you are building this thing. So these things drive your architectural decisions, essentially. So once you understand those, you're good. You, can un you understand the context and the scope of what you're building. If you can draw a system context diagram from the C4 model, you can achieve that goal. So we're done. If you understand the significant design decisions you are making as a team, and again, these come back to technology and modularity and decomposition. So if you can draw a container diagram from the C4 model, you can meet that goal, and you're done. You can move on. If you have a way to share these ideas with other people, and again, good diagrams allow you to create that shared vision, you're in a good spot, you can move on. If you're confident that your design is going to work and it satisfies the key drivers, so scaling and performance, et cetera, then you're good. And if you've identified the major risks associated with the thing you're going to build or the thing you're going to change, and you're happy with the risk profile, how do you get happy with the risk profile? Concrete experiments. Proof, proof concepts, prototypes, tracers, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of basically writing some code to prove a hypothesis. So this is something I'm weaving into this whole uh, concept of upfront design as well. And for me, once you can do those things, you're done. And again, we're not trying to decide everything, but there are some things that I think we really want to focus on. It's the significant decisions. How do we do that? It's the toolbox. There's a whole bunch of tools that we need in our toolbox. Some of these techniques are older, some are more modern, kind of event storming, event mapping, impact mapping, um, et cetera, et cetera. There are formal and informal ways to review architectures. There's a whole bunch of stuff here I'd kind of urge you to go and look up. 
So what I'm trying to do here, of course, is I'm trying to create that starting point. I'm trying to set an initial direction, but admitting that we're not going to get everything right. And we are going to iterate, put stuff out there, experiment, pivot, change direction. We're going to have to do the evolutionary design thing as well as some degree of upfront design. People ask me how you practice this. Go do some architecture carters. You don't mean, need me to help you. There's a bunch of architecture carters out there. Ted Nuda has a bunch. Neil Ford has a bunch. I've got one on my website as well. And this is a great way to figure out, you know, as a team, how do we do design and what level of design is appropriate for the things we are building. And my whole closing slide in this talk is really adopt an agile mindset. There's a whole bunch of techniques and tools out there that we should be using as software designers, developers, and architects. We need to find the set of tools that work best for us. And that is that. Thank you very much.